And these are the areas that over the last 10 years, Town and I and our students at the University of Kansas and our collaborators in the Philippines have done biodiversity surveys throughout the central part of the Philippines. And there's that storm track right through these areas. So this represented a very, um, you know, in addition to being a disaster and an incredible, um, uh, an incredible, um, uh, very serious um, story about how we can prepare for natural disasters like this in the future, this represented a, a very interesting uh, opportunity for scientists to study how natural areas that are subject to frequent or even catastrophic period um, catastrophic disturbances may recover after um, these big disturbances and how communities and forests might rebuild after heavy disturbances. Here's another view. Um, we, tried to, we basically tried to digitize this in a couple different ways, but the blue dots are all the sites where we had done survey work. And so I hope by now you're thinking um, to yourself, the, um, you know, this represents a really interesting resurvey question, a reason why you might want to go back to the exact same sites as Town mentioned and resurvey in the exact same way that you did before. So you have comparisons, statistical before and after comparisons that you could make um, to understand something very fundamental about biodiversity. How do these big, rich communities of birds and mammals and amphibians and reptiles, when you have assemble, you know, if you have a community that has those 85 species, what happens after all the trees, the forest is devastated, which species drop out, which species invade that area? You know, there's all sorts of ideas about the ways in which super biodiversity, biodiverse areas might adjust and then rebuild after, um, after destruction um, and disturbance like this. So basically what we've done by way of an experimental design is, is, is pick out a transect going north to south across these, wind, these varieties of wind speeds. And these are the areas in red dots here where we intend to or have or have begun the planning for resurveying um, um, at, across this level of this gradient of destruction across the central Philippines. And then the areas in the blue dots are the areas where we could potentially um, go back and do additional surveys if we can develop the funding in the future. Um, because all of this has become much more expensive than we thought it would just due to the, um, the challenges, the logistical challenges of trying to work in an area where the roads are ripped up and, and old highways are now covered by trees. And, um, and uh, of course, the human condition is, has to be the thing that is dealt with first, and that relief effort is ongoing right now, of course. So um, I just want to end with some pictures of these forests um, that I took um, on some of my earlier surveys and trips where I went there as a grad student. And you can see these beautiful multi-tiered forests with herb layers and shrub layers, understory trees, and then canopy trees. And the sunlight is almost, it's, all, it's very dark inside these forests. A very small amount of sunlight gets down to the floor. They're very cool. They're very wet year-round. Um, here's another one where you can see the ground is basically wet, even on a very sunny day. Intact forests that have, a, have an atmospheric set of atmospheric conditions and a microclimate because of the, the shading of those areas and then just all that vegetation and all the, the processes that are going on. Here's a view inside. So this is this site here. And here's a view inside that forest um, from about six, uh, four months ago. And you can see the people who are, who are doing the work here are climbing over trunks of this was a, a path that we took in and out of the site mul many times. And just getting in took us so much more time because we had to just climb over trees the whole time um, because those areas are just, the forest floors are just covered with the down trunks. And you can see what's happened to the forest structure here as well. Um, and in areas that, um, and in areas, so basically here's quickly following the area uh, after the, the hit of one of these typhoons versus an area a couple months later where the regrowth has begun. And you can see that lots of these trees are bushing out again and there's lots of vines that are climbing up the trunks. And those are probably different species of vines that are now exposed to a lot of light and are able to climb into the canopy. And so the structure of the vegetation is changing. But um, the canopy is gone. If you look at these, these pictures, you can see there's, it's all the sky is all open white. And so these areas that were really cool and wet are now hot and dry at the same times of year because of all that solar radiation is now getting to the forest floor. And so we would anticipate that that would impact everything all the way up the food chain from all the insects and the invertebrates that are there, all the things that eat them, the birds, the predators, the, the plant composition, the herbivores, everything ought to be impacted in, in very interesting ways. So again, here's the canopy before in one of these areas. And here is the damage to an area nearby that is small scale damage. And this is a storm that hit actually after 
um, Hyon and shows, this is Typhoon Glenda, that shows the damage to the canopy and the opening up of a canopy. And then here is large scale impact of Haifu, Typhoon Hyon or uh, Yolanda where there's no canopy and the trunks are just, they just end and the, the canopy was completely ripped off the top of the forest. So, um, so what we want to do with this project, is, which is um, a project that's funded by the National Science Foundation with a rapid response research grant, um, is go back to these areas and ask, answer these questions, or at least begin to answer them in, in a context of a real natural system that has that north-south gradient across the disturbance corridor and allows us to look at it at many different sites. And we want to answer how has na catastrophic natural occurrences impacted these megadiverse forest communities, which kinds, which species are gone, and more importantly, which kinds of species are gone, which um, which groups of, of organisms across the, the food chain are gone, you know, what, are they the, the, the canopy birds? You might expect that those are the birds that might be gone if there was no canopy left, those types of questions. Have new species arrived? Do we detect the occurrence of additional species that we didn't detect before? And what types of species have newly arrived? Are they invasive species? Are they edge species? Are they open area species that can now penetrate the forest? Right, you can see how this could get really interesting with just a little bit of focus on those types of questions. Um, and then we want to know over time, how do these diverse communities restructure and reorganize if we go back now and then in five years and then in 10 years and our colleagues and our students can go back in 20 years? Can this tell us something about how really rich communities um, deal with catastrophic natural periodic disturbances? And then of course the ultimate question might be, does this, do these types of disturbances actually contribute to diversification by moving species around and, and mixing up the combinations of species? And does it evolve, you know, over evolutionary timescales, does this result in things like new combinations of fauna and, and productions of new species and movement of whole groups from one island to the other and those types of in, uh, interesting evolutionary questions? So I'm gonna stop there and um, I just, does anyone have any questions about those types of, uh, those types of studies? Mm -hmm. It's mostly to all of the lecture. It's a kind of deal, um, a comparison between doing sampling in existing trade or doing sampling in new trade. So, because while cutting a new transect inside the forest, mm -hmm. after leaving, it becomes a pressure because you have hunters. Sure going uh, inside the forest and uh, uh, increasing pressure uh, on the other species of uh, of organisms there sure yeah. so i wanted to like i wanted to know what's your position yeah those are those are difficult questions i mean the question is do you when you go back to an area do you go back to the same trails where you've worked or do you cut new trails and when you go into survey an area like a complete and intact forest do you create uh, a trail that can be a um, an avenue for hunters and for or people who might be illegal loggers or poachers to extract resources from the forest. Um, those are always, that's always sort of a, uh, something we keep in mind and, and something that we want to minimize our own impact and then also close the door behind us when we leave so that we don't open up a highway for loggers and poachers to go into the forest and, and access um, and access, certainly for commercial purposes, access um, the, the biodiversity, the wildlife there. Um, you know, I guess the things that, that I've done has been to, have been to sort of um, uh, initially enter the forest in a way that causes little disturbance. You know, basically leave the road and don't start cutting a trail until you're a couple hundred meters away from the road so that anybody driving by won't see the trail. You know, those types of things. Um, I don't know, how would you respond to that, Tan? I mean, I think that that's, that's the kind of thing I've done is just try to cause as little impact um, and create as few new routes into the forest as possible. But in some of these areas, you might have a very good reason for going back to the exact same place. And so naturally that traffic of people will create awareness of that, that entryway into the forest. Um, Maybe I'm a pessimist that I would, I would say that the impact that a survey team is gonna have will probably generally be minimal compared to the impact that the local human populations will have. Um, in the Philippines, a general view is that it's this riding tide, rising tide of deforestation. So everything below 700, 1200 meters mm -hmm. 
is usually completely deforested. And so, you know, putting 20 people in there or 10 people in there to do some surveys is probably fairly immaterial compared to that. Yeah, I agree with that. Yes. Thank you very much for the presentation. I would like to, to know if after a disaster or after an ecosystem has been disturbed, how long should uh, we wait before uh, uh, implementing a survey mm -hmm. in a way formally event arise? That had been formally, yeah. Uh, so the question is, uh, following a disaster like this, how long should you wait to do the first survey after, if you have an area that has been characterized before and then there's a natural disaster? Um, I think, you know, if you can get there as soon as you can, then you have the sort of baseline data. So um, if I could have, um, as sad as it was to see that disaster in the Philippines, I would have gotten back and taken a whole team of people and done a survey at those six sites, you know, within a matter of one month or two months after the destruction. But because of the, the relief effort and the incredible human suffering that was going on, I just couldn't do that. Logistically, it wasn't possible. Um, you just, there was no way we could get there, you know, there, um, and the human condition had to be addressed first. So it wasn't possible. So we basically started that process six months, nine months after the disturbance. But I think um, some of the most interesting comparisons will be immediately following a big catastrophic disturbance. So if you can get back to an area right after the disaster hits it, or right after there's been some kind of disturbance, even a drought is a very impactful disturbance. You know, even um, a strong windstorm that knocks down trees and opens gaps in the forest canopy is a big disturbance. So if you can follow right on the heels of something like that and as soon as possible get there, then you know where it starts, the recovery process. And then you could come back, you know, six months later, nine months later, a year, whatever, whatever your strategy is. But uh, I think the answer, the long, the long, the short answer to the long-winded answer I just gave is as quickly as possible, I think. Yeah, good question. I think there's one more. Yes, sir. Uh, I have two, two, two questions. Sure. Um, I think when uh, David was giving his, his talk, he talked about being able to um, <coughs> detect um, changes based on long-term surveys. Okay. Do you uh, So okay, so David is here. Um, so I was wondering, how do you do that? Do you also record individual numbers, for example? Is it based on like encounter rates and? And if you do that, how do you avoid like multiple records of the same species, for example? Uh, and, and the second one would uh, be for Rafe is that you talked about food cost uh, time constraints such as, so in the case of the Philippines example, uh, do you put up like plots or francis or you choose a uh, a micro habitat and then you just make sure that you put that same sample intensity of 20 hours uh, that how do you do that okay but you take the first question I'll come back to that yeah so there's different ways that what I had shown you there was more or less just this number of species encountered per search event okay. but we're also interested in abundances right so we can also take account of how many individuals of each species did we see at a given time? Because, you know, you may frequently encounter a species, you know, every time you go out, but you used to see a hundred of them and now you see one of them and that's important, right? So I think having some estimate of that is important. The, the question of how do you avoid, you know, recapturing the same individual, mm -hmm. different fields have really different approaches to that. Uh, and some we will mark them. I mean, if you're really concerned about that, say you're focusing on one pond and you're worried about the frogs in that one pond, it would benefit you to have some way to mark individuals. And there's, you know, in herpetology, there's different ways that you can do that. You know, for instance, snakes, I think we were talking about yesterday, you can take clippings of the scales on the ventral belly, right? So they're in unique patterns, so you can identify them when you find them again. Because that way you know that, you know, it's the same snake you saw yesterday. Right. Uh, so there are, there are tools for doing those type of things. 
so yeah, abundances and also the number of species you encounter when you go out are I mean, both important pieces of information. And then your question, the second question had to do with um, the kind of sampling effort that you might make in the follow-up. Um, and so we're going to talk about this a lot tomorrow. Um, but I think the short answer is you could imagine both an effort-based sampling, where in, the, in this case you mentioned the 20 person hour days. So um, in Aurora, the, that example, we had done these 20 hour days, so we wanted to focus on doing the exact same, or as close as we could get to the same sampling effort. That's an effort-based sampling, where you do the same level of, um, of sampling effort or survey effort um, over a, you know, a standardized amount, a certain number of nets, a certain number of pitfall traps, a certain amount of traps per day, or in our case, a certain number of person hours searching per day. But another really interesting way to go about this is something we'll talk about tomorrow, which Town can comment on more here soon, um, which is results-based sampling. And so for the, the project in the Philippines, we're going to basically tr sort of try to do both and piece together both effort-based sampling and outcome or result-based sampling by going back through our field notes and deriving the, the, the results-based sampling from our records um, and then take the same approach. But because we had this opportunity where we had the before data and a big impactful um, disturbance came along, we're trying to go back to those exact same sites and climb those exact same transects, go to the exact same camps where we stayed before, and we're even using the same people, the same investigators who did the work because we know that everybody has different ways that they see things and have different search images. And so we're just trying to replicate the whole effort again um, before and after to start the process. I'll just throw in that essentially for both points, um, some of the software tools that we'll explore tomorrow, Estimate S, um, are able to make these comparisons of, of change um, but taking into account the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is the value of that fully populated daily list yep. where essentially you're not um, just looking at the accumulation curves because there's more information about abundance, mm -hmm. prevalence, essentially the, num the percentage of sampling, samples in which a species occurs, and abundance and these different tools are able to essentially measure turnover, but taking into account that there may be less data, less information in one data set than in the other. Right. And so we can go beyond um, rather simple measures of, well, I found these additional species, but essentially, given the completeness of the first data set, what's the probability that you would have found additional species without any change? Hmm. And then, what's the probability that these new species that you found are indeed new to the fauna or flora? Right. right. So, and then the results-based sampling depends on those same software tools where essentially you're analyzing your data as you go. And we'll do this by hand in the field um, this next week just for fun. Um, you can do it better if you were to take along a, a small computer that could do the calculations. Um, but essentially you need to do these completeness analyses that we'll talk about tomorrow along the way and use those as a, as a way to decide when you're done with some sub-portion of your overall inventory. We'll talk about it. Good questions. Yeah.